Hello, and welcome to another Q&A episode for our Shavasana Intensive. I'm Lizzie Lassiter, and joining me is Judith Hansen Lassiter. Hi, Mama. Hi, Lizzie. So this is in concert with a digital course that we've released that is called the Shavasana Intensive. And the basic idea of the course, as many of you know, is 21 days of rest and silence. So if you haven't enrolled yet, I encourage you to visit lassiter.yoga, www.lassiter.yoga, and watch a short video or even consider joining our free trial. We ask students who are already taking the course if they have any questions about Shavasana or if any new ideas have come to the surface as they're doing this intense practice, this intense inner practice. So the first question we wanted to talk about today comes from Sherry. And actually a lot of people submitted very similar questions to this. So mom... Sherry's question is, what is the difference between meditation and Shavasana? Hi, Sherry. I like your question. It's a great question. So the way I think of it, if we start in the center of a line, a horizontal line at zero, and we go, let's say, to the right, we go into stages, mental stages of wakefulness. We go in we can measure them physiologically with brain waves, but we go into normal waking consciousness and hypervigilance and mania on the extreme, where you don't sleep for days, a pathological state. Go back to zero, we go, if we think of that as meditation, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute, and then we go the other way from mania, we, we get into restful state, and then relaxation and be levels of sleep in from lighter sleep to deeper sleep to coma. So there is, there is a wide variety of mental states. And in many ways, meditation and Shavasana are the same, but in some significant ways, they're not. And I think it has to do with where our attention is. I think of meditation as a seated practice, which my eyes are partly open, partly closed, and the intention of my meditation practice is, is to move toward pure awareness, so that the awareness of what arises, what we call outside of this particular location called me, and the, what arises inside this particular location that I call me is part of a greater field of awareness. So my focus is really almost like I'm sitting on the fence of consciousness. I'm not, it's a choiceless awareness. I'm not choosing one point. But when we get into states of relaxation on that left-hand side of the continuum, what we're doing is we're closing our eyes. We're becoming not interested, we're choosing not to be interested in the external world. We focus on the body sensations, maybe at first, or the breath. And then we keep going inside and we get into a state in which external stimuli is experienced as being less important to the central nervous system less important to our thinking. We are becoming deep introverts. And why I, why I like this way of thinking of it is in part because most of the day we're extreme ext extroverts in a way. We're focused on task, on doing, on looking, using our hands, uh, on our students, on driving. Hopefully we're focused on driving. Uh, but we're focused outside. And Shavasana is the pendulum swinging the other way in which now we're deeply focused on the inside. And that's part of the soothing balm of Shavasana. While as meditation to me is in the middle. So I hope that helps. Yes. April writes, she has a question about the struggle. 
And I identify with this question as well. She's, she writes, sometimes I have a great Shavasana. Other times I struggle. How do I stop struggling? It's a paradox. If we are, for whatever reason, maybe what we've eaten, too much caffeine, or tiredness can sometimes make you agitated in Shavasana, or whatever reason that our body mind is, is not doing what we want it to do. We, it's what disturbs us really more profoundly than that is what we tell ourselves about that is we, why am I agitated? I shouldn't be agitated. I'm supposed to be relaxing. I've done this for 15 days in the course. I should be getting better. What can I do? How can I be different? How can I can I get away from this? How can I change it? How can I fix it? And that is the suffering. That is the difficulty. What I'm hoping to suggest to you is this happens and, th and that you hear this. I'm hoping that you hear this with your heart. That happens to everyone every once in a while because we're human beings. So I think the only solution is to say, oh, right now I'm agitated. And don't lay on top of that awareness the judgments that that's somehow wrong. It's, it's the agitation about being agitated that is the true problem, if you, if you can hear that. So some days you might just be lying there and somewhat restful, but really not as deeply as you would like. But you don't have to make it worse by adding to that your judgments and your thoughts about why it shouldn't be that way. I read something great recently that we have to let go of the idea that there's something wrong with us. That's the first step. I've been playing with that recently. It's very profound for me. How often in the day or in my yoga practice I realize I had the thought there's something wrong with me. Yes, and another one that goes along with that is I'm not enjoying this. <laughs> I should, I should be enjoying my life at every moment. Yeah, should Shavasana be pleasurable? Well, it usually is, but if you... It's the clinging to the belief that there's something wrong to me, with me. It's the suffering. It is the clinging to the belief that I should enjoy my life at every moment. That is the suffering. It, because difficulty arises... Humanity, resistance, all of that arises, but what makes it doubly bad is what we tell ourselves about it. And that's really the learning, is to continually become the larger container to step back and allow within the container of our consciousness all the moods of our being and still be at ease. At ease with where and what I am in the moment. Right now, I'm just fill in the blank. That's just what's happening. And that attitude paradoxically allows Shavasana to find you. I once said to someone, you know, stop looking for, you know, you don't have to look for God. Just sit down. God's looking for you. So Shavasana is looking for you. It's waiting to find you. But unless we're willing to just be in the silence and the stillness, regardless of the quality of our, of our thoughts, just lie there and be still. Even if it's not as deep as you would like, it's still good for you. So just right now, let Shavasana find you. Let sleep find you. Let happiness find you. Oh, I like that. I, I always like all of the poetic side, the poetry in your teaching. I wanted to move us now, though, to two sort of technical questions. We got a lot of, I want to say thank you to all the students who submitted questions. We won't be able to get to all of them. And some of them were so highly specific. But I've picked two sort of technical questions that I think apply 
or have a lot of overlap for many people. So Adeline, sweet Adeline, restorative teacher in London, writes, in basic Shavasana and legs on the chair Shavasana with regards to the position of my sacrum as it is in contact with the mat, would you say that the contact is along the top or the middle of the sacrum? Hi, Adeline. Always lovely to talk with you, even in this way. So let's clarify sacrum. Sacrum is the sacred bone, I call it. It's the curved bone at the lower back. It ends in the coccyx, and the top joins with the fifth lumbar vertebra, and it's curved with the concavity. The shorter side of the sacrum faces forward, the same direction our face does. So it is part of the vertebral column, but the segments are all fused together in one curve, sort of like a saucer is curved. And when we lie on the floor, Adeline is asking, should we tip the tailbone, what we would now call up, so that the top of the sacrum near the lumbar is down? I personally like to uh, have my students rest on the very center of the sacrum, so sometimes I have them as they're preparing for Shavasana bend their knees and lift their pelvis up a couple inches and then set the sacrum down on the floor in the position which feels like the exact middle from coccyx to up to top sacrum at L5 and then to the side to set it down exactly in the middle. And then holding it there, put the legs one by one over the props. Okay, great. And another technical question or sort of propping question is from Pam who writes, I like the neck prop, but I wonder why we don't prop the waist area, the lumbar curve. I also think that's a really interesting question. What, what is your take on that, Mom? All right. Hi, Pam. The lumbar curve, the back waist and the neck have the same arch. She's correct. They, they have the arch in the same direction with the concavity, with the shorter side of the curve facing backwards. But we have, we have the structure around the area is very different. So what I want you to remember is that when you're lying down, you've changed your relationship to gravity. Gravity is not moving down through the spine like it is when you're standing. So it's not detrimental to the neck, for example, to be in slight flexion. But what I also want you to remember, it's my goal is not to flatten the neck or to flex it. My goal is actually to, to move the skull. Imagine if you could, that it's just the skull, the chin is dropping slightly, so the skull is rolling if you're lying down, the, the bridge of the nose is moving down toward the feet. It's more an upper cervical movement that has profound effects upon the mind. When you want to pray, when you want to meditate, when you want to be think about something, we, we tend to drop our head because we know that the slight flexion of the upper cervicals is an introverting function. When we want to think of something, we lift the head up, we roll the skull backward. Now, of course, you can't isolate the upper cervicals from the lower cervicals. So what you will get some flexing or flattening of the lower cervicals, but again, not, not problematic for the neck generally because gravity is not acting through it. But then you take the outer rolls of the blanket and you stick them, stuff them under the side of the neck, which helps maintain the shape of the neck. The lumbar is different because you have the buttocks and the buttocks when you're lying on the floor help maintain the lumbar curve in its neutral position. Then when you put the legs up on something that, that does a similar effect of dropping the chin. There's just a slight release in the lumbar, but we don't need to try to flatten it down. There's no reason to do that. So I hope this helps you. Okay, moving to our last question in conclusion, our last question from this session. 
It's from Karen from Canada. And I have to say, we have students taking the Shavasana intensive from all over the world. And I've been so humbled by the amount of positive feedback we're getting from people who are saying it's changing their practice, it's changing their teaching, it's changing their relationship to themselves. So keep doing Shavasana. Um, Okay, so Karen from Canada writes... First of all, thank you for creating this course. My practice has been almost daily, and I'm not judging myself when I've missed one. With joy, I'm discovering that regular 20-minute Shavasana practice brings a calm and clarity of perspective into my life that I so deeply appreciate. My question is, any suggestions about how to sustain that perspective through demanding times, often hours later when not on the mat? Thank you so much for your question, Karen. It is, yes, Liz, Karen? Yes. Um, yes. Well, the, the funny answer, Karen, is you can't. <laughs> that's terrible. That's why, that's why we practice every day, because practice is a form of remembering. And we, we are so used to instantaneous power in the world. Press these figures on your phone. Talk to someone in China. You know, that technology has to work fast. The traffic should flow faster. Everything should be efficient. There should never be a, anything that takes more time than we want to give it. And that's part of what we're learning is that it takes as long as it takes. It takes time for the nervous system, which is gone has seen a crossroads and gone to the right all your life, and now you're asking it to see a crossroads and to go to the left. And it will sometimes, and you'll forget. You'll forget again and again and again. So practice, Get that's why it's so important to do 20 minutes every day and not two hours on Sunday only or something. It's reminding the nervous system of how you want to be in the world. And I think another thing that might help you is when you come out of Shavasana, don't just rush into the next thing, but sit there a moment or lie there with your eyes open and take in and consciously imprint and welcome and open the door to a nervous system that is different. Acknowledge it, celebrate it, welcome it. It just takes time. What I'm hoping that our Shavasana practice brings to us is, is a default reaction to our world, to ourselves, to our minds, to the, everything that's around us, the default reaction of compassion and empathy. That's, that's what our practice is about to me. That's where it's leading us, that a default reaction of empathy and compassion for ourselves when we're not empathetic and compassionate. We keep stepping back and offering that. It doesn't mean we don't make hard decisions. We don't make, it doesn't mean we don't make mistakes or say things we wish we hadn't or do things we wish we hadn't. But the default reaction to that instead of judgment is compassion and empathy. That's true transformation. And all the practices of yoga, meditation and breathing and self-study and shavasana and All of it is pointing us there. But Shavasana to me, and I've often said this, is the Tadasana of restorative yoga. It is the foundation. It's it's preparing the field of our consciousness so that compassion and empathy can grow there. So we're compassionate. We're compassion farmers. We're empathy farmers. And our practice is about that the remembering of our best selves. Thank you. Thank you, Mama. And thank you, dear listener. Again, I want to encourage you to visit www.lassiter.yoga. You'll find the Shavasana Intensive Digital Course, and there's a free trial with a free sample of mom guiding you in a shavasana you might want to try and there's a short video you can watch about the course so sending you a big namaste namaste mama
Namaste. May we live like the lotus, a home in the muddy water.